their spiritual leaders ended up being the right of government to participate either through the, the emperors during the Byzantine Empire uh, selecting and removing uh, patriarchs and bishops uh, so that and down to today when the Turkish government uh, and or maybe the Greek government uh, or maybe even the U.S. State Department has some sort of a say in the selection of, uh, of our spiritual leaders. Uh, the, um, there are several quotes that I would like to bring to your attention. Uh, one of them was a very, very good uh, article that was written by Professor uh, uh, Jim Cornelis uh, back in 1982. It appeared in the the program book of the Clergy Lady Congress at that time, in which he analyzed the four constitutions of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of North and South America. And in that analysis, he determined that in the first two constitutions, there was a provision for the laity to participate in the selection of their bishops. Uh, through the Clergy Lady Congresses at that time, uh, lay representatives and clergy had the right to uh, participate in the nomination of candidates for the episcopacy of the American Archdiocese, and then the American bishops would select one of the three candidates, and then that was sent down to Constantinople, and they would approve automatically whatever that selection was. That ended uh, uh, very shortly in the, in the 30s, in the early 20s, the first two constitutions had that right. In the 30s, there was a monarchic uh, constitution that was kind of imposed by the Church of Greece, and then in the 70s, there was another constitution that the laity had no participation in, in approving. And in the later ones, uh, there was no lay participation at all in the selection of hierarchy. Uh, and in fact, even though the constitutions provide for some sort of input from the bishops, uh, what the practice apparently is in the American Archdiocese is that the archbishop selects whoever he wants to be the, the, the bishops, and he personally makes that selection and that's forwarded on to Constantinople. Uh, in that article, Jim uh, concludes with uh, a personal observation <clears throat> as follows. This reader believes that the development of an operative democratic church within the title of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of North and South America is inevitable, though he may not live to see it. Sort of like our first comment. Further, this democratization will occur only when the American church takes seriously the theological anthropology of the church and sees that that anthropology becomes the basis of a Christ-like church, a Christ-like ecclesiology in living practice. The true ecclesial independence of the American Orthodox Church rests in the achievement of a Christ-like ecclesiology for creativity, wisdom, and piety will be her gifts. The church is one priesthood of believers, clergy and lay with one head, the Christ. And I think that that's, that's a goal, certainly, of the Orthodox Christian laity, is to generate the kind of discussion and the kind of dialogue that really has been missing from, our, from the body of our church so that these issues can be discussed and perhaps during our children's lifetime. Uh, some of these changes that we're talking about can, can come about. Uh, there's also a couple of other quotes that I thought uh, are significant. As long ago as 1969, uh, Archimandritis Eusebius Stefano uh, wrote, and this, this is in your, in your material, uh, in one of the issues of the Logos, uh, lay participation in the election of the clergy, be they priests, bishops, or patriarchs, is normative in the orthodox practice and dates back to the earliest days of Christianity. Further on, he says, not, ironically, not only the laity, but even the, the priests today are kept out of the, uh, in the, in the jurisdiction of the ecumenical patriarchate, are kept out of the elections of their bishops. No practice in the orthodox church could be more untenable and harmful, both canonically and historically. Only proper enlightenment and religious maturity can displace the ignorance and religious infantilism that in this respect sustains the docility and inertia among the priests and laity of the Greek archdiocese. And in his, his conclusion uh, that are also included in the paper is that the OCL probably would be better uh, uh, advised to 
lobby for the, the uh, rights of the priests first. I mean, if the priests themselves cannot be consulted and are not able to participate in the selection of their own bishops, then he thinks, you know, trying to get the laity uh, as the first shot is, it would be uh, almost uh, impossible. Uh, his recommendation is that the, that the, the OCL uh, work towards the first of two steps. He sees it as a two-step procedure. First, to get the, the, the priests, they have a right to select or participate in the selection of their hierarchy, and then as a natural consequence of that, uh, Father believes that the, the lady uh, will, will come along, their rights will be restored to them. Uh, that's really all I wanted to do as far as an introduction of the, uh, of the theme of the selection or election of, of hierarchy. What I'd like to do is I'd like to open this up to uh, uh, discussion, uh, questions. In most, most audiences like this, people don't ask questions, they make counter speeches, and, and that's, that, that per, that, that's, that's really what we're looking for. We we're, we're, we're really are not, the, uh, this is not the typical question and answer period where, where you ask questions and, and I will try and answer. I'd like to have uh, Andy Copan uh, and, uh, um, where the, where's, is Father Mark here? What, what, I, I need some help, really, is, is uh, what it comes down to. And I don't want it to be one voice answering uh, questions. Uh, what I would like to do is I'd like to generate discussion. Uh, that's really what we're all about. As we're walking up, one thing I would remiss, I did not uh, introduce Father's uh, Presbytera, uh, Elaine, uh, who's, uh, as I mentioned to some of you yesterday, I, I'm an old-time Detroiter, and uh, Elaine and I should have to be from the same community of St. Constantine's and Helen in Detroit. So if you would just stand, she's a, a partner. I'm just wondering if we might have, have Father Mark and, and uh, Andy and, and, and Father, why don't you all come and stand up here in front? And then what we'll try and do is, I don't know if we have another mic back there. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, but per, uh, Well, I'm just thinking in terms of uh, if, if we have uh, some discussion to, to be able to hear what, what's being said. But speak, speak up and we'll try to uh, uh, respond to whatever dialogue we can generate. You want to be seated? I think that might be more more informal. I just wanted to say something about, you know, the structure of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese. You know that the uh, Archbishop serves also as an exarch for the ecumenical patriarchy. And I'm a member of a small diocese, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church in America, uh, which is a canonical option for the Ukrainian Church. And we serve under the ecumenical patriarch. So Archbishop Yakovus serves as our exarch. You know, a, a kind of a channel the ecumenical patriarch. And we believe very strongly in the ecumenical patriarch as a visible sign of unity in this church in America. And what I wanted to point out simply is that in these smaller jurisdictions, which are kind of uh, 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 serve under the umbrella of the Greek archdiocese, there's a very democratic process often of choosing bishops, you know. The laity engages very actively in the choice of a candidate. And a candidate is presented to the ecumenical patriarch and uh, Archbishop Yakovus accepts that presentation. So that if you yourselves are deprived of a voice in this process, there are dioceses who participate with you, who have a very active role in choosing their bishops. So there, there obviously is nothing inconsistent here, because you know it's tolerated right within your structure. Uh, let me add a few more remarks there. Uh, We've been engaged, uh, many of us here, been engaged for years in, uh, in uh, doing research in this matter. As Father Yvonnek mentioned, uh, he's very definitely right. The patriarch uh, has an exarch in this country, and that is, of course, the Archbishop Yacobos. And the word exarch means he's a representative of the patriarch in this country. And sometimes in countries where there's, uh, where the Orthodox people have been occupied areas, like in the Turkish occupation of the Balkan nation, the Bishop is an exarch. A recent example is Makarios, in the uh, late Bishop Makarios in Cyprus, uh, who, who means that he's an exarch. He represents also politically uh, the people in the halls of, of, of power. 
Uh, an example, a uh, very big example of that was the Ikhwan uh, Patriarch here in the Turkish occupation was not only an ethnarch, he was also a very important political leader. He had political authority over all the Orthodox Christians under the um, Ottoman Empire, and he was also an official of the Sublime Port of the government of the Ottoman Empire until 19, until the First World War, when um, uh, Turkey, modern Turkey, was erected under Kemal Ataturk, and an attempt was made to secularize the Ottoman Empire. Uh, so as a result of that, they decided to, to separate church and state, like we are in this country. The Caliph, who was the head of the Ottoman uh, Muslim faith, was done away with in, uh, in uh, modern Turkey. And of course, the Patriarchate was to be done away with. But there was objection <coughs> from the power of Western powers, and that resulted finally in the Treaty of Lausanne, uh, which ended the hostilities in World War I between Turkey and the Allies. And the Treaty of Lausanne specified that the, the new Turkish state would guarantee the inviolability of religious minorities, Christians especially, in the uh, modern state of Turkey to uh, maintain their religious institutions. Now, it does not mention the patriarchate in itself. Uh, it's mentioned in the minutes, in the verbatim notes of the, uh, of the of Street of Lausanne. Uh, but that means that uh, under political uh, international law, these notes become part of the treaty. So the Patriarchate has indeed an international status. Uh, but this interna international status has been, of course, abrogated by the fact that the Patriarchate is subject to Turkish law over and beyond uh, the fact that the Turkish government recognizes the, the right of it to exist. The Turkish law being that, as George mentioned, he must, the, the Patriarch must be a subject or a citizen of, the, um, of, the, of Turkey and a resident and other harassments that have taken place, in, especially in the last 30, 40 years of Cyprus trouble, uh, harassments intended to induce the Patriarchate to leave of its own accord. And as you know the story, I'm not, not going to repeat it, but uh, how something like 100,000 Orthodox Christians in, um, uh, in uh, Greek Orthodox Christians in Istanbul, indeed, out of 12 million Orthodox Christians in Turkey during the, uh, World, uh, World War I, there's only a uh, scant 100,000 left in Turkey today, and less than maybe 5,000 Greek Orthodox like Christians in Istanbul. And of course, the Patriarchate is nothing but a shell. But, and with the Sri Lausanne, the, the Patriarchate was secularized. Its political and temporal power was shorn away, and that's when the change was made, uh, that uh, the election of the Patriarch would no longer be uh, involved uh, lay people, but would be only uh, brought about by, by the Holy Synod, which is the governing uh, body of the uh, of the great church of Christ and the church of Constantinople is known. Now, that does not mean though that we cannot, that we cannot um, uh, once again reinstitute lay in, uh, involvement. The recent pa the, the patriarch of uh, Moscow, Alexis II, was elected by 66 bishops, 66 <coughs> priests, and 66 laymen from the 66 dioceses that make up the Church of Russia. Lay involvement. The Archbishop of Cyprus is elected, nominated by the laity. Uh, and as Father Yagola mentioned, many of our only uh, our jurisdictions here, like the Ukrainian jurisdiction, is, is, uh, is under the Ecumenical Patriarchate, as the Albanian group and other groups, uh, which are governed by their own bishops, but recognize the authority of Archbishop Yaakov as the exarch of the Ecumenical Patriarch, but they left the government themselves, and they have, as was uh, mentioned, uh, this type of, uh, of lay involvement. The important thing is, and I, I will be, I'll be, I won't be too long, but I'll have to speak. The important thing is that, as Father so aptly put it in his remarks this morning, which I think were, was, uh, was um, quite uh, 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 impressive, is that we have to stand up now and speak up. <coughs> this is what OPL is all about. <coughs> We're not out to reform the church in terms of theological. We have no quarrel with the uh, theology of the church. We have no quarrel with the, with the role of the bishop. The bishop is the church. Where the bishop is, there is the church, according to the uh, Orthodox theology. But also, we as the Laos, the people of the church, play a very important role. And we need to be heard, and we need to be listened to, and we need to be involved in the electoral process of our hierarchy. Not only from the patriarchal level, all the way down to the local bishop level, and to our priests. And, and we have to empower not only the laity, but as pointed out by George in, in the remarks by Professor Connell, 
also our clergy. Our clergy are powerless, just like we are. And our church is not, we are here that it, our church is not democratic. It's hierarchical. Yes, it's hierarchical, but there's a democratic element in it. Our church in this country is not even hierarchical. It's monarchical. <clears throat> we have a death spot, as Father Evolnik pointed out. And with all due respect to his eminent archbishop, was a very charismatic person, most of known, love him, and respect him. But the time has come for the, the lay people to get up with the clergy, to be also the OCL involved with clergy, to speak up and to be heard. And this is what we're all about. This is why Steve Speakers have worked so hard with commissions, seven commissions. We have done in one year what the archdiocese has not done in. <laughs> 75 years, we have uh, we have addressed the problems of the of the church, dealing with the selection of hierarchy, with the unity of the, of the church in this country, with the role of women, uh, with the race and spirituality, the language issue. We have sat down, we have commissions working, and we have addressed these problems, and they're all here now for your consideration, for revision, for your input, so that we can finalize it and present it to our hierarchs and our respective churches. Um, uh, in the near future. I think this is a, an enormous accomplishment. If we have done nothing else, we succeed to hear. That's a hard act to follow. <laughs> Doc, I would just make a couple of remarks to, uh, to kind of set some tone for the uh, discussion that follows. I don't want this. I'm not used to that. You can hear me in the back, can't you? Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, I would, only, I would only caution, as we as we go forward and discuss these issues of election of hierarchs and, and role of laity, I think it's appropriate to put it in the context of our faith. The church is not an organization. The church is an organism. The church is a living body. The church does not have power and rights. These are secular models. And even though sometimes they serve to articulate some of our positions, uh, we should not employ them uh, too much at heart. What we're talking about, I, I do. And I benefited tremendously from the paper which I read. And I think it has a wonderful program. But what we're really talking about is a healing process in the body of Christ. Lay people have been excised in many ways. They've been cut off almost with, like a tourniquet. You know, put a tourniquet on to stop bleeding. And I think sometimes that has motivated the authorities in the church where they see a gash in the process. They put a tourniquet on, but at the same time they cause gangrene in the limb that's below the tourniquet. And the time is to take it off and allow some healing to begin in the body of Christ not so much invasively reintroduce the laity into the life of the church. If you don't think you're part of the life of the church already, and that you are the church already, you have no business being here. You already are the church. You're already part of the body, and I think we need to return to what St. Paul has said. You know, the eye can't say the ear, and the foot can't say the hand, and the nose can't say the ear. You know, I don't need you. We all need each other. So I would just encourage that we try and see this process not as a process of reclaiming something that's been taken away from us. That's not Christian. But you see it as a healing process, a therapeutic process by which to bring the body of Christ to the fullness and to the whole. Thank you. that I have, and it, it somewhat follows uh, Father's remarks, is that uh, one thing we've talked about here repeatedly is uh, the democratization of the church. And I think it's important to keep in mind 
that, that that concept is really a 17th or 18th century concept uh, of, of democracy and developed by principally the, uh, uh, the English. And uh, I, I think what we're really talking about here is a, is a, um, a restoration of the church's ecclesiology. And as Americans, I think it's important that, that we keep this distinction in mind lest uh, we confuse uh, American institutions and elections and polls and uh, processes and so forth. And uh, at least it, we, we, we discussed a good deal about models, and I think there's a very uh, great tendency for us to, to essentially erase whatever line uh, distinguishes uh, Western uh, democracies from uh, the church's historical processes. And, and I think those two are distinct. And, and in terminology, we use the same terms. And, and, that's, uh, and that, that is what concerns me, is that essentially it's going to become, uh, you know, there's ballots and, and campaigning and, and almost the, the, the whole uh, electoral process that, that we see here in the United States. And um, I don't think that it has been sufficiently addressed. And I, I'd like to turn the mic back over at this time. Any other uh, comments? Father said about planted cultures, and uh, maybe it's just a strong term, but I do really think that um, you really hit on something we need to be, as we uh, move along in our discussions, that we really need to deal with, if I can use the word, the sociology of the culture in which we live. And I uh, uh, always hate to personalize it, but my 98-year-old grandfather died four years ago. And he always said to the last days of his life, he says, Peter, don't look behind, look ahead. And those who came here and laid the foundations of the church looked ahead so we could be here. And I think what we're doing, the process that we're doing here is we're looking ahead. We're looking ahead to what kind of a church, what kind of values we will leave here. And I thought that Father really hit on that, that we have to deal with what we are here. We're not going to restore any... Uh, any previous uh, sociological or cultural uh, uh, ideal or, or existence that we had earlier. And I think it's very important because once we get that out of our mind, we, 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 we revere it and we reverence it, uh, but our real, op our real obligation, our obligation is to meet the needs of, uh, of our children and of ourselves as we live today. And it doesn't, it doesn't mean that you forget your ethnic background, and those of you who know me or some of us, you know how fanatic we can be about those things sometimes, but it doesn't mean that you have to forget it, but you have to deal, deal, deal with it, and I think, Father, I thank you for that for that uh, particular uh, observation. I think it's very important that we keep that in mind. Steve? Yeah. Uh, I wanted to address, uh, and I, I apologize, I didn't uh, remember the gentleman's name, but the guy from Michigan who uh, spoke. Uh, I want to dip with him a little bit. You know, one of the unique things about, about our church here is that this is a church in America, and we are Americans. We have our own very distinctive culture. It includes a political culture. And that culture includes, at its best, uh, a devotion to, uh, to human rights and tolerance and democracy. And uh, maybe this is our this special contribution that we as Americans make to, to the worldwide life of democracy, just as... Uh, as Russia and Greece and other countries have made their own distinctive uh, contributions. And American democracy, I grant those, to some extent, the 17th and 18th century ideas, but many of the greatest leaders of our democracy have been really very profoundly molded by their religious background. You look at guys like Abraham Lincoln, who was a very religious man, his speeches sometimes, uh, like his like sermons, and uh, uh, Martin Luther King and, and others, they've all been affected by uh, of individual human beings. I think there could be worse things that can happen to our church. I mean, I, I think one of the best things that can happen to our church might very well be for some American political notions of equality, <coughs> democracy, and human rights, and the like, make their way into the religious culture. 
James Tomas is from Detroit. Uh, I'm not in here, as you can see, uh, quite a few of us are from the uh, Detroit Diocese, but uh, I don't think that's an indication of our hierarchy. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yes. right. uh, two things, two notes. Uh, one on uh, comments uh, that were made in reference to um, a reconciliation or uh, healing process, if you will, and the other on the uh, worthiness of uh, recognition in uh, the selection of the hierarchy. In order for something to get healed, you have to recognize first that there is a problem. And it seems to me that the hierarchy as of right now, as a matter of fact, this very moment, has not recognized that there is a problem. So I think in, from that point of view, we're perhaps uh, knocking on a, on a, on a door that uh, is perhaps in our imagination. The second point, though, I think is more fundamental, and that is how do we select the bishops? Through the church, the Orthodox Church, if you look all the way through the apostolic canons, and uh, even if you look at the apostolic father's writings, you'll notice that there is two ways of the clergy being selected. The first one is what is called Theokritos in Greek, which means God was actually, uh, uh, had some form of uh, uh, influence within the body and uh, he was actually asked by God to be uh, in the ministry. And the second one is by the people's exclamation. Uh, the, the point that I want to make though is the people's format. One, I will mention only one example and then if you want you can find a, an abundance of them. Uh, the most famous one is John Chrysostom. Uh, until the very last moment when he, had, he was actually enthroned to be bishop. He refused to be a bishop. And he only became because everybody in his diocese wanted him to be one. Anyway, we are in 1991. I don't want to dwell on uh, what happened in 360 something. In 1991 though, we have a very, 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 very super important role to play in the selection of the clergy. The only problem is we don't exercise it we do not exercise it. So for us to look at the canons, for us to look at the tradition, for us to even sit in here and take precious time, where other things are concerned, uh, to me, forgive me, uh, is a little frivolous because we have to understand what the real problem is. And the real problem is, as the same goes, we found the enemy and the enemy is us. We are the enemy. We have the rules, the appropriate rules right now to have the proper authority in selecting the bishops. And that's only one word. And the word is, on every enthronement of a priest, of a deacon, I'm sorry, of a deacon, of a priest, of a bishop, of a metropolitan, of even a patriarch, when all over is done, the bishop that he is enthroned in that priest, he takes him by the hand and he says, Axios, and what do you folks say? Axios. Why? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why, folks? You don't have to spend another minute in dwelling on that problem of selecting the bishops and, and the priests, in my way of thinking. My way of thinking is that we have to educate the people that when that bishop takes that person, that candidate, and says, Oxios, you say, Anoxios. <laughs> Now, the problem, the, let me also tell you why I said we have found the enemy and the enemy is us. Let me also draw you some modern experiences from the Church of Greeks. And uh, reluctantly, I have to turn sideways because I know we're in the United States. But the example that I will share with you is the Bishop of Larissa. Maybe some of you have been following what's been happening in Greece for the last two years. The people of Greece precisely has done just that. They have called their bishop an axios, but the hierarchy of the church refuses to listen to them, to the point where there have been incidents that the bishop performs the liturgy with only himself and guards on the gates. Okay? Let me reiterate my point. Let me reiterate my point. We have a voice in selecting the bishops. The only problem is we are...